People who find a dead body unintentionally share their creepiest stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy the video. We didn't find the body, but a neighbor of mine passed away a couple weeks ago. I hadn't seen him in a while, and he had a we missed you notice on his door for a while, but he was a hoarder and had all of his windows covered up, and honestly, he was kind of an odd guy, so I usually just gave the whole situation a wide berth. He was nice enough, though, and it was weird, so I decided to just keep an eye on it. A friend or another neighbor of mine had set up a camera outside to deter whoever had been stealing our packages, and one night I noticed that there had been a movement ping. At this point, we were checking in a lot to see if the neighbor was out and about, but instead, we saw that the police had arrived. We listened in as best we could on the camera and overheard that he was found in his bathroom with meth and had fallen, hit his head, and died. We watched them carry his covered body out for the camera. It was really surreal. We had been just about to ask our landlord to check in on him, but you never really think that's actually what's going on. The worst part is that the police were called by our neighbor's old roommate that had been arrested previously for getting into a physical fight with him. He told the cops he was the guy's doctor, let them in, and then left. The next day, the doctor slash roommate slash assaulter showed up and started moving stuff out of the apartment. We contacted our landlord to ask him about it, and he had no idea our neighbor had died or had had a roommate. The guy was basically looting our dead neighbor's apartment and we were also very suspicious that he had something to do with our neighbor's death. We gave all of the recordings from the camera to our landlord. I left for school one morning and lived near an old woman I saw regularly and was polite with. She walked her dog early in the morning, I assumed to avoid school kids, but I was made to leave very early every morning. Anyway, I took my normal route and found the body under a bridge just across the field that was almost next to her home. The dog sat there guarding their owner, waiting for her to move, which obviously wasn't going to happen. She was old and gray, skin and all. I tried to wake her, checked her neck for a pulse, and got nothing. I didn't know what to do, I called 999 and had to wait until someone turned up. A black Mercedes van, an ambulance, and a police car turned up. I was basically asked how I found her, and details were taken and taken to school. I had to see the head of my year while situations were explained, and then I swear to God that was it. I just went to school, and I don't think it scarred me. I mean, the situation was a little scary, uneasy, and creepy, but all in all, I don't think it ever affected me weirdly. But yeah, that's how I accidentally found a dead body when I was 14. Trigger warning for Hurricane Katrina survivors. I'm not sure if it counts as unintentional. My stepdad was an EMT during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. We lived in Algiers at the time, directly across the river from the French Quarter. After the storm had passed and the violence had more or less died down, he called my mom and me and told us to meet him in Laplace, about an hour outside of Metro New Orleans. He had borrowed a handicap accessible ambulance to hide us in so we could get into the city, quickly pack up our house, and then leave. The ambulance had been used to move bodies to designated drop zones so they weren't just strewn across the city, and let me tell you, some smells do not ever leave your nostrils. Not years later. So we hid in the back under a blue tarp as he drove through the checkpoints past the military and came out when he told us it was okay. He had to take a very specific path to get to our apartment due to the destruction, and we got to see the pre-cleanup destruction. A few bodies here and there, as well as some things that shake the foundations of what I thought was physically possible. I've told this story a few times at bars, and with much more detail. And I usually get asked about the worst thing I saw. It was a mailbox. Stuck inside a steel girder like a toothpick through paper. That was how my brain realized how bad the storm really was. I saw piles of dead bodies, and I didn't want to see them, but I wanted to get my stuff out of my house. You can decide if it counts or not. I did. I worked in a rougher area of town, and I was just getting there to open up shop since I was in charge that morning. It was completely normal to find people sleeping behind the building. Typically, you just shout a bit to make sure they're okay. If you knew them, you started to get to know the people working down there, maybe you'd shake them awake. Give them some water and a timbit if you have some, and send them on their way home or to a shelter. One morning seemed the same, except the guy wouldn't wake up. Didn't recognize him. I tried splashing water. Nothing. I gave in and shook him a bit. Nothing. I checked for a pulse. Nothing. God damn it, I thought. I called EMS, went, and scanned the camera system to find out what time they got there and if anything happened. There was no blood or signs of injury that I could make out. And the camera system showed that he walked there and lied down by himself. Archived the footage and sent it to the police. That's it. 
That's all it was. I have no idea what happened to him, no idea the cause of death, I suspect it was odd, and nothing from the cops beyond my initial statement when they arrived and the email I sent them with the video footage. Given there didn't seem to be signs of foul play, at least not anywhere related to my work, I guess there isn't really more that could have happened on my end. So me and my brother were floating down a river that runs from the suburbs of our city to the Mississippi River, about a 9 hour trip. We get about halfway there when we reach a rough part of the city. The river is badly polluted, it's recently been dredged, so the bank is sitting like 10 feet high on either side to help with flooding. We look and see what looks like a man's torso and legs but can't tell, so we paddle closer to the bank and start screaming. There's no response, as by now we can definitely tell it's a person but can't see his top half. It's the middle of July at noon in the south, and nobody's sleeping through that. We call the cops, give them the GPS coordinates, and keep on down the river. The cops had the audacity to ask us to stay with the body since it's deep in the woods to help them find it. Hell no. We weren't staying in the hood deep in the woods, so we lied and said the river was pulling us downstream. Seven minutes later, a helicopter starts circling our position as we keep paddling. We finished two hours early, as we decided not to make any stops and just had lunch in the boat. We get a call from the sheriff's department later confirming our description of the man and proceed to get hammered and go see a movie to take our minds off it. I'm so glad we couldn't see his face, but it was probably the last time I ever float that section of river. I grew up in the 80s and 90s in East St. Louis, Illinois, in poverty that really only compares to backwater Appalachia. This is not an understatement, even living 5 miles from downtown St. Louis, Missouri, we used wells and creek water and would go months on end without electricity. While I have never found a dead body, our house was deep in the woods at the end of a dead end street. Unless you knew it was there, you wouldn't know it was there. And as you got further from State Street and the street lights got further apart and the trees got taller, you would find a little side street that was the perfect place to dump trash, cars that you were going to burn, do drugs, fuck, or dump the dead body that little brother found when he was five. My mom and I were walking down to the end of the street. Again, no one knew we lived there except the firemen and cops that frequently had to visit because of the ditched cars that had to be towed away. I always said black people don't go into the woods, and that kept a lot of prying eyes and real crime away from us. So my brother just casually sees this person and says. Is that dad? I'm sure my mom's reaction was absolutely hilarious, but unfortunately it wasn't my dad's. So dad died on a public bus. When you live in a city like that, people with a bus pass just get on a route and ride until they can't anymore. So I guess my dad got on the bus at some point and, just like that, died. They drove him back to the station, and that's when the driver checked on him, and yeah, surprise, dead body. But anyway, my mom just passed recently, and I mean that in the vaguest sense possible. My brother had gone to check on her, and she had been dead for at least a month. Not that any of us didn't care or didn't check on her, we are all older and live across the United States, struggling every day to literally escape around two decades of trauma. So anyhow, all six of my brothers and sisters showed up to attempt to clean this apartment that had a human being decaying in it for a month with literally zero assistance from the landlord. Her apartment was infested with bedbugs, mice, and roaches, plus flies, maggots, and everything else that comes with death in Midwestern spring. None of us really wanted anything anyway because of the aforementioned trauma. The landlord was being a total dick about any kind of help, even split between the six of us, a dumpster rental would have cost thousands of dollars. So we just left almost everything behind. Not out of disrespect for her, just because between the smells, the infestations, the trauma, there was really nothing else to take away. Also, fuck landlords. I told my second oldest sister that it feels like we've been moving bodies all our lives. And it's shocking how much time we just spent soaking in actual death, to the point that normality isn't mundane, it's unrelatable when your barometer is calibrated for another hemisphere. Weirdest day of my life. I was going to high school and listening to music on my headphones, and then I heard a loud but dry bang. I took my headphones out but couldn't figure out where they came from. After walking a few minutes, I saw a man lying halfway down the street with a trail of blood running from his head into the asphalt and a small hole in his forehead. A policeman was diverting traffic so people wouldn't run him over. Putting one and one together, it really looked like the man tried to run, but the police shot him in the head and he fell. I went to school, and a few hours later I googled and found out the MDI was saying the man simply felt sick and died. I got confused because I heard the bang and saw the hole in his head. How were the police there just a few minutes after he fell? I don't like conspiracy theories, but that really looked like an execution by the cop and a cover-up in the media. So I had just wrapped up a bad sales call where my buyer was getting cold feet and or didn't really know their budget. 
that's fine, and it happens, and my job is to help them understand their budgeting process and get executive approval. I get off the call and take a walk outside the office to brainstorm on how I can not only help them justify the spend but also make sure it closes in the fiscal quarter. I'm walking by a Starbucks, and this heavyset homeless guy is chatting with some Starbucks patrons when, bam, he starts freezing up and hits the floor. I'm right next to him. There was no pulse and no obvious choking. I started CPR and I'm doing chest compressions. I realize I've got to do mouth to mouth, hesitant at first but going full bore after the first round. I felt the guy's ribs cracking, I think, while doing compressions. I did that for an eternity, probably three minutes. Boston PD and meds showed up, but that guy straight up died in front of me, and I really wish I could have saved him. I went back to the office, and my boss asked about my close plan on the account. I was walking to the train station when I heard an almighty thump and train brakes, and this poor old guy was lying on the other side of the fence. I climbed it to get to him, and when I'm there, I find he's got a massive hole in his head. Poor bugger. I felt for a pulse in his neck, and it was very thready, then it stopped. I guess I was in a bit of shock or something, but I just left. It was the middle of the day, and there were other people around, so I guess it's not too bad. Two things struck me, though, the contact with the train knocked him out of his shoes, and there was a huge roll of $20 notes sticking out of his trouser pocket. I think maybe he'd been to the nearby bank and was in a hurry to go somewhere and just didn't beat the train across the crossing. I didn't steal his cash, if you're wondering. Immure white trash, but not quite that poor. Myself, my dad, and my best friend went out to watch the Perseid meteor shower on August 12, 2014. We were out there for a few hours. Coyotes were always present during one of these outings, but they were always off in the distance and never really came close enough for there to be any issues. However, around 2.30, the coyotes were getting very close and pretty loud. We got kind of spooked, so we decided to pack up and head back to the city. I lived in Winnipeg at the time, so it was about a two-hour drive back. We had just come through Lundar, Manitoba, when I noticed there was a car on fire in the ditch. We were the first on the scene. I screamed at my dad to pull over, jumped out, and ran over to the car to see if there was anyone trapped inside. Thankfully, there was no one inside, but as I looked around, I noticed a young man lying motionless on the road about 20 meters away. He had been ejected from the vehicle. He had sustained very serious, life-threatening injuries to his entire body, face, and head. I could hear him grunting or groaning. As I ran over to him and began talking to him, asking if he could hear me, he looked at me, but he did not speak. His arm was completely turned around and disconnected from the socket, the bone in one leg was completely exposed, and the left half of his face was completely shredded, exposing tendons and muscles, his jaw, and his teeth. We applied first aid to what we could with the first aid kit that we had, and I used my sweater to stop the bleeding around his leg. All the while trying not to touch or move him too much. I told him if he understood what I was saying to just stay still, focus on me, and squeeze my hand as hard as he could with his other hand, which he did. After a couple moments of dealing with man number one, my best friend sat with him while my dad remained on the phone with 911 and set off to look for anyone else. I took my phone flashlight and walked around the initial crash area to look. As I got close to some tall grass on the other side of the road, I could see two legs sticking up from within the grass. Something about the two legs, completely frozen still and upright, stays with me to this day. I can only compare it to a Barbie doll, respectfully, I absolutely lost it at that point and started to yell that there was another man down here in the ditch. I did not go down into the ditch to investigate, but my dad did. And he stayed with him. During all the panic and commotion, number one tried to sit up and stand on his own. I quickly ran over and reminded him again that he was very badly hurt and needed to stay still. Paramedics were on the way and told him that his friend was going to be okay and that he needed to just lay still and focus on my hand and stay awake. We were on the phone with 911 for what felt like an eternity. They were sending two medevacs from Winnipeg, and it would be 15 to 20 minutes before they arrived. I kept talking to this guy, reminding him that I was here, to stay awake, and to just focus on my voice. Because of how rural this area is, there were no other cars on the road. It was completely silent and very dark. No semis, no cars. Just complete silence. I kept holding his hand and talking to him, but he started becoming slower to respond. I just kept reminding him that he wasn't alone, that I was here, and that paramedics were on their way. Finally, he stopped responding altogether. I kept shining my phone at him periodically to check on him, but by this point, his color had changed. I performed CPR until the paramedics finally arrived. We sat in the car in complete shock for about 45 minutes, during that time, neither one of the medevacs flew off. 
we knew at that moment what the outcome was. About three years ago, I went back to Winnipeg for a visit. We decided to go and watch the meteorite shower again, taking the same road we took that night. We came across a roadside memorial for one of the guys and left flowers. As horrible as it was, I'm thankful we were there to comfort them in their last moments. Neighbor whose health had deteriorated significantly. I was helping with doctor visits and driving for a few months. He had a hard time eating anything and definitely displayed cancerous symptoms, weight loss, anorexia, constipation, joint pain, etc. A specialist had put a stent in his bile duct and stretched his esophagus, all ominous signs but no diagnosis. I went to check on him one morning. He always left his door unlocked, in a semi-rural area. I found him on his bedroom floor. Dead. In fact, he was stiff. I have a work history in frontline health care, so I've seen a few dead people. My mistake was calling 911. I told dispatch he was indeed dead and that emergency services were not required other than the coroner. I'll send someone, she says. First responders arrive, followed by ambulances, police, coroners, and then funeral guys over a period of two hours. My neighbor would have been amused and sarcastic that so many people attended after his demise. He was an amazing asshole, but a lovable guy. I still miss him. I worked as a delivery driver for Milo's, a small sandwich company kind of like Jimmy John's. There was a woman who would order every day. When I say every day, I literally mean every day. From the first day I worked there, she would call in her order every morning. Well before we even officially opened, so she could be the first delivery of the day. She'd always order two subs, a cookie and a soda. A few days went by without her ordering. We even called her to make sure she was okay, and she said she just wasn't feeling like ordering. So I come in on a Saturday, we're really slow, and I thought it would be a nice gesture to just give her my free meal for the day since she's such a good customer and seemed like a nice lady. I get to her house, knock on the door, and nobody answers. I then call my manager for the day and say I'm a little worried because we know this woman doesn't leave her home. She can't drive, which is why she gets food delivered every day. I ask my manager if we should call the cops just to have them come check. He says it's fine because I still don't have any deliveries coming in. So I called 911. Tell them I'm sorry. I'm not even sure if this is a real emergency, but I just wanted somebody to check on this woman, who is known to never leave her home, but she's not answering. The cops get there and break down her back door to get in. One of the cops comes to my door and tells me that she's dead in her bed. Her family wrote me a letter saying that they were supposed to visit her in the next few days, and I saved them from having to see their daughter dead. I read the obituary, and it said she died from hypothermia. I'm not sure if she wasn't using heat in her home or what, but it wasn't that cold outside. It's so sad either way. I wonder what she was going through the last week or two. When I was six and my sister was eight, we were playing in the woods by the lake in the apartment complex we lived in. When you first enter the woods along the side of the lake, there's a long trail, and just past the lake, the trail starts to sharply go uphill. Nobody ever went up the hill to see what was up there because, as kids in the early 80s, urban legends were reality. One day we said, screw it, and went up the hill. We saw an old building in the distance, and as we approached it, we realized it was the church where we had gone to preschool. On our way back, we thought we were big shots for debunking the stories of kidnappers, killers, etc. at the top of the hill. Then I saw part of a flannel shirt under the leaves. To this day, I couldn't tell you why I decided to try and pick it up, but I wish I never had. Because when I did, the first thing I saw was a human hand sticking out of the end of the sleeve. We freaked out, completely terrified, and sprinted home and told our parents, who, of course, didn't believe us. Their best friend, who lived above us, was morbidly curious and decided to go check it out. He came back and told our parents we were playing around and there was nobody up there. They let us believe we had imagined it all. Fast forward several years, and as teenagers, they decided to tell us their friend confirmed all those years ago that we did in fact find a dead body. It was a homeless man in his 40s who had died from exposure. They said at the time that they lied to us because they didn't want us traumatized by the event. Their approach worked, because not long after, we had pretty much forgotten about it. Then, when we got older, it wasn't traumatizing at all, because to us it was more of a ha, we told you so kind of moment. But when I think back to six-year-old me seeing that, nothing since has hit me like that moment in time did as it happened. I was in my mid-twenties, my wasted years, a hardcore heroin addict, homeless, and living on the street. An acquaintance of mine, I can't really call him a friend as there aren't many friends amongst desperate and broke junkies, had just gotten his social security check, and we had just copped some Mexican black tar heroin and were walking up the hill in downtown Tacoma, Washington, 
to an abandoned house on the hilltop that a lot of us would use as a den. It was in bad shape, and the cops would regularly check it for squatters, junkies, and crackheads. Anyway, as we got to the house, we noticed that nobody seemed to be around, and we walked around the side of the house to the overgrown backyard, where we were going to sit on some back steps and fix. We saw him as soon as we turned the corner. He was lying on his back, his pants pulled halfway down. It was obvious he was dead. His face was swollen and purple. A dark shade of bluish purple I've never seen before in my life. My acquaintance took a stick and poked him a few times. It almost looked like he had died in the middle of taking a shit in the backyard. I don't know. Being the incorrigible junkies we were, we even had a short discussion about checking his pockets for money or drugs. But neither of us did. My buddy recognized him as a homeless heroin addict he knew from hanging around the soup kitchen and men's shelter in Tacoma. He had probably gotten his check too, got a bunch of dope, overdosed, and just passed out alone in the backyard. We didn't even know if we had been the first to find him that morning. So we walked down to this consignment store a block down the hill from the house and told the clerk that we needed to call 911 and let them know there was a dead man laying in the yard up the road. I still remember the clerk, probably in her late teens or early 20s, being a bit gothy and hippie-ish, giving us looks of disbelief and skepticism. Admittedly, we were a pretty grimy pair. But she let us use the phone. We headed up to St. Joseph's Hospital, snuck into one of the bathrooms, and fixed we separated, and I headed down the hill without a care in the world. I later learned my buddy had gone back to the house and watched from across the street as the cops and ambulance arrived to pick up the body. I will never forget the shade of purple on that dead man's face. I had a lot of friends over those several years, but I was never around to see them go. Just wouldn't see them around and learned that they were gone. I eventually cleaned up, went back to college, got married, and had a family and a beautiful son. I was lucky to never end up being one of those dead bodies. My brother and I were kids. We were swimming and playing in a tranquil sea when we noticed the body of a young man floating face down nearby. At first, the movement of the waves made it seem like he was moving up and down, but we quickly noticed he was not. We started to walk out of the water, yelling that there was a drowned man, it was a sunny summer day, and there were plenty of people on the beach. The most surreal scene unfolded. As reality began to sink in for the onlookers, different people started screaming drowned man, but nobody did anything. Then a middle-aged man ran into the water, stood next to the unresponsive, floating man, and looked at the watch on his wrist for a little while, like he was measuring the time or something. The middle-aged man then ran out of the water, screaming drowned man, without doing anything. It was so strange. Suddenly, a rush of young, panicked men screaming a name, the drowned man's, rushed into the water with all of their grit to pull him out. They laid the drowned man on the beach. I'll never forget the look on his face, he must have been in his twenties. A small crowd gathered, and someone told my brother and me to run up and down the beach yelling for a doctor, which we did. The crowd got bigger, and I believe someone tried to administer CPR. The drowned man's family, including a younger sibling, was in shock, crying, and yelling his name while he stood motionless. Eventually, EMS came. As they put him in the ambulance and drove away, someone shared a rumor that EMS had heard a pulse. Later that evening, when I was at church with my family, the service was dedicated to the name of the drowned man, so I assumed he had not been able to be revived. It was very sad and surreal. Yes, about six or seven years ago, I found my aunt upstairs dead from an apparent overdose. Methadone and Xanax I lived with two of my aunts and my daughter in our old family home. And my aunt, whom I found dead, had used drugs and alcohol most of her life. I used to come home from work in the afternoons and find her lying half off the couch, just fucked up out of her mind and I remember telling her every day for about six months I'm going to come in one day and find you dead. And she would just laugh at me and tell me to stop worrying. The night before I found her, she was fine. Her and my daughter planted tomato plants outside, and she seemed fine. She would get her check, stay messed up for two weeks out of the month, and then usually be sick for the last couple of weeks. I was going to spend the night with a friend and was getting dressed, and I remember I had these pink jean shorts that I had gotten in three different sizes because my weight fluctuated at the time by about 10 pounds anyway, the last time I talked to her, she was jokingly telling me she needed some of those pink shorts so she could get her a friend to go stay with like in the old days. I told her I loved her and left. The next morning, I picked up breakfast and made it home around 7.30. I left theirs on the stove and went to lay down, although I couldn't sleep for anything. I just kept having a nagging feeling. I finally got up around noon, and my other aunt sent me upstairs to let the dog out of my other aunt's room, and I'll never forget that as long as I live. She wasn't just lying dead on the floor. She was kind of face down on her knees with one arm outstretched under the bed, like she was looking for something under the bed. 
Her blood had pooled, so everything towards the floor was just purple, almost black. She was also naked from the waist down, so I could really see it. It's an image I'll never forget. I couldn't sleep for a couple of weeks. Every time I closed my eyes, that's what I saw, and I would hear that laugh. I called her my only son. She had two, but one died a few years prior from an accidental suicide while cleaning a gun. They were more like uncles to me because my grandparents raised them, but we got along like siblings. I didn't know what to do, but I called him first, and he got there before the ambulance, and as he ran up the stairs, he told me to come on. I'll also never forget him crying and screaming while cradling his mom. I just hugged him as he hugged her. Really sad experience. My mom and I are really close, and she has experienced addiction all of her life as well. She is now addicted to fentanyl, and it breaks my heart. I have this terrible underlying fear that I'm going to find her the same way, and I can't escape it. I pray that she gets off of it before that happens, but I don't know. Sorry for the delay. I was 16 and on vacation with my family. We are from Canada and we're visiting family in the US. My father is a volunteer firefighter in our hometown, this is relevant to the story. I cannot remember what state we were in at the time, just that we were driving on I-95. To prevent boredom, my dad, siblings, and I would play a game, kind of like I spy. We would pick an object in the distance and guess how many kilometers away it was. My dad would set the trip odometer to zero, and we would watch to see who was the most accurate. So we were playing this, and I picked a big object in the ditch in the distance. As we got closer, we could see it was an old pickup truck. It looked to me like it was from the 1950s, it was very rusted, and I had the impression that it had been sitting down deep in the ditch for a long time. Probably everyone else on that highway thought the same. As we got close, my dad suddenly yelled, the interior light is on. And he quickly pulled over and quickly reversed down the shoulder of the road. He was frantic and yelling something about how we always pull the battery. My dad ran out of the car, telling my mom to call 911. She got on her cell, and we watched my dad run down into the ditch and crawl inside the open window of the overturned cab. He then got back out, holding a shoe, and after a moment, found another shoe lying not far from the truck. At this point, I got out of the car. I ran towards him, and as I got away from the noise of the highway, I could hear the radio in the truck playing music quite loudly. My dad came over to me and explained that if someone had survived and left the scene, they would have taken their shoes. He told me to start looking for someone because someone could be hurt or dead. The ditch was quite marshy, with tall reeds everywhere. There was a fence line and a tree not far away, and on the other side was a field of wheat. I followed him, and we looked through the reeds. I think we both saw it at the same time, but once we got close enough to the tree and could see past the reeds, it was very clear that a person was lying on the ground. I froze and didn't move, and my dad ran up to inspect and quickly came back and told me to walk away, the person was dead. We went to the car, and he joined the call to 911 to explain what he found. He didn't tell me this for a long time after, but he said that the chest of the man was facing upwards and his face was turned towards the ground, he knew immediately that he was dead. He had been flung from the vehicle and hit the tree, snapping his neck. The force of his launching from his vehicle is what knocked his shoes off. The man had not been wearing his seatbelt, so as his truck rolled over into the ditch, he was thrown out through his open window. If he had had his seatbelt on, he would have been fine. The truck had very little damage, and the cab was still in perfect, rusted, condition, just upside down. Since we had pulled over, other cars started pulling over, and some people were approaching. My dad explained what was happening, and other people started looking for a possible passenger. Ambulances and police arrived soon after. But the rest of everything was a blur. No other body was found, we had to stay for a while and make statements to the police, and the other drivers left. But I remember sitting on the side of the road by the car and watching the paramedics lay a white sheet over the body. It had been at least 12 hours and thousands of vehicles had gone by before my dad pulled over. He knew that nobody had been to the scene of the accident because of the barely visible light inside the cab. They always disconnect the battery before leaving an accident site. It was a very weird experience, but it made me proud of my dad to see how fast he picked up on all those details. My dad received congratulations from the local police department and they sent him a newspaper article about the incident. He wasn't able to save this man, but there have been maybe 10 other incidents in his life where he has been off duty, and some when he was still a kid, and was in the right place at the right time to save a life. Damn Reddit, I didn't plan to make you my diary today, but I really need it. It's an important day. Ignore voice to text errors. My first memory where I recall not just an idea but visual details is being asked by my grandmother to wake up my uncle so the three of us could go to breakfast. He was in his early 50s and had a lifelong history of very serious alcohol abuse, and I would suspect, 
Just looking at the state of him in pictures, drug use. It's really inconsequential things that I remember because I didn't understand that anything serious was happening, but the shades were drawn, and it was really, really dark in there. It was a guest room, but he would crash there sometimes if he needed somewhere to sleep. My dad kept us away from my grandma's house during those times. The headboard was to your left when you walked in, he was on the left side of the bed towards the far wall. And then some amount of time that I don't remember at all, but I have a weird feeling that it was too much time, like, maybe I was poking at him or scared of going all the way in there because it was too dark. I didn't know him very well. There's a gap there, and all I see is a pack of cools, a wife beater, and the very wrinkly skin of a man who ran himself absolutely ragged. Then I'm in the living room telling my grandmother that Uncle Robbie won't wake up. She asked what I meant, and I said I didn't know he wouldn't wake up. I can only imagine that my grandmother knew what that meant after so many years. The next memory is EMTs or coroners shuffling around and my dad holding me, and me just kind of looking around, observing with again zero impact on the situation. I don't think this had any trauma on me or anything at the time or for most of my life because I didn't have the capacity to know how sad it was. My grandmother sacrificed every bit of her life for her kids after my grandpa ran back to Ireland. My dad protected him at all costs as his older brother. Even with those two things, from the way it has been told to me in short stories, more often than not a funny version of a not funny situation in which a car is flipped, he's shown up with another elopement wife, or he and his drunk friend fly an old Cessna over Boston back when this wouldn't get you shot down, and he jumps out near blackout with a poorly packed parachute, my dad was a parachute rigger in the Navy and then owned a skydiving company when I was a kid. He once said addicts love skydiving because he wonders if it's the only thing left that gives them a rush. It makes me wonder what he's addicted to. All in all, Uncle Robbie was a lost cause from the get-go, and all you could do was laugh at the shit he pulled when he decided to come around. Eventually, voids become who you are, not a wound to heal if you leave them long enough. It's such a huge moment, not only as my first memory but also as a morbid one, and one that looks way too familiar right now. He was a very forgotten soul, all the stories are of him coming and going out of the woodwork, a new girl, a crashed car, but always going back to it to be invisible again. This topic of my finding him came up in an offhand comment a few weeks ago, and my dad said he didn't remember that, but he was distracted, and I don't think the impact of what I said translated at all. He's not the only one who brushes off that comment, I think the assumption was that I was too young to remember any of it. I'm going into this too much because a little catharsis is needed today. I sent myself to rehab for the booze and got sober in August of last year, but because of a horribly abusive system in the state of Massachusetts, it was a mistake and it destroyed the self-worth that I had left. I was passed around by patient brokers because I had the golden ticket to insurance for them. I felt good and strong, I was happy, and I knew I was doing well enough to leave, but then their blank check would be gone, so they had to convince me that I was hopeless, I'd be dead in a ditch on Tuesday, and my family was tired of my bullshit. I had had no consequences besides the slow erosion of my quality of life up until then. I made the choice to go on my own. I was proud of that choice. Most of my family was surprised. I had a six-figure job, no criminal record, a loving husband, etc. One week of detox and then back to work turned into a year yesterday. I was and am destroyed. When I finally made it out of the system, almost four months, three facilities, two sober homes, and $123,000 later, I realized that half of a person with a bipolar diagnosis had been untreated for quite some time. I see now that I was in mania, which I've recognized I've gotten in the past, but when you're in a constant state of either going into or coming out of being drunk, there's a bit of a stabilizing effect. I went scorched earth. I never spoke to my job again, despite having an open invitation to return, why would they want me? I left my husband, which, granted, was on my mind for some time, but my God, he deserves another way for it to be done. My dog is gone with him. I've stopped talking to my family. I'm in a SHT apartment alone, all day, every day. I'm sick, and we don't know why the word demyelinating got thrown out a couple times. I tried to get help for substance use disorder and no insurance because I missed an enrollment date, and the state magically lost any record of my trying to reach out. It was too much. A shitty friend from rehab did what only a very shitty person would do, which was introduce me to a drug I'm too embarrassed to say. It's been almost 8 months of mind-numbing isolation. My family knows I'm not okay, but no one would dream that I'm this far gone. It's not just that the bipolar has swung to a low, it's a whole new world without the alcohol. I mentioned needing this because I've been building up to ending it with my dealer for a couple weeks, and he's thankfully on board. I sat in the car and watched him delete my number and text after blocking it. I did the same, and he wished me luck. It's not like I'm ever going to go to rehab again, 
So here we go. Here's today one of white knuckling it so that one day I don't have to be found by a confused little girl who thinks nothing of who you were as a person because you were mostly a ghost to us, and now I know all too well, a ghost to everyone else too. I hope you found some happiness amid the pain that most people oversimplify into words that eat away at how you see yourself and how you operate in the world. I'm sorry that the stories I've heard have reduced you to a single dimension and beneath saving before you even had a chance to fight your way out. You probably picked up a bottle, a pipe, or a needle to cope with that new and terribly dark worldview. It's 25 years later, and I could never have imagined that in any lifetime I'd be able to understand who you were and how you died. I see you now.